hyper-conservative values have steadily become part of the mainstream. Poland already has one of the most restrictive abortion laws in Europe, but now a group of governing Law and Justice Party MPs have successfully asked for a wider ban. Some pro-choice demonstrators have already taken to the streets to voice their displeasure. The BBC's Adam Easton reports. In downtown Warsaw, a clock counts down the days to the court's ruling. People in cars show their support for a woman's right to choose. <laughs> Opinion polls say a clear majority of people here do not want a more restrictive abortion law. It's already one of the most restrictive in Europe. But some bishops and lay Catholic groups pressured the governing Law and Justice Party to make it even tougher. Almost all abortions in Poland are performed because of fetal defects. This ruling effectively introduces an almost total ban. Even those who qualify for a legal termination can find it difficult to have the procedure. Doctors can refuse on the grounds of freedom of conscience. One woman who faced local challenges despite tests showing her fetus had severe defects was Katarzyna. She only had the abortion after a national consultant stepped in. I don't think I could survive this sense of helplessness and the contempt from the medical community if something went wrong again with another pregnancy. The governing party supports traditional Catholic values, but it found itself in a difficult place. There is opposition both in Parliament and on the streets. In 2016, 100,000 women took to the streets to block attempts to almost completely ban abortion. That's why a group of MPs decided to ask the court, which is dominated by pro-government judges, to rule on the issue. Adam Easton in Warsaw. Well, let's move across Europe for some brighter news. And a court in Greece has ordered the immediate imprisonment of the leader of the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn Party and six of his fellow former members of parliament. Not to be dismissed, it was only eight years ago when Golden Dawn received 7% of the vote in elections, gaining the party 21 seats in the Greek parliament. Nikos Mikaloliakos was sentenced last week to 13 years in jail for running a criminal organisation. The BBC's Mike Sanders has more. Golden Dawn's opponents called the defendants in the five-year trial the largest assembly of Nazis since Nuremberg after the Second World War. 68 in all, many of them former members of Parliament. Several were police officers who covered up or turned a blind eye to beatings meted out by Golden Dawn thugs, to migrants, left-wingers, gays. At the forefront was Nikos Michaloliakos and six of his fellow leaders, one of them a serving member of the European Parliament. They denied being neo-Nazis, but their flag is the red, black and white of the Nazi party. The Greek key symbol on it could become a swastika with a couple of tugs. They used the Hitler salute. They praised Adolf Hitler in their publications. They associated with football hooligans and European neo-Nazis. And yet at one point, 7% of Greek voters backed them, making them the third largest party in Parliament. Why? For some, because they delivered cheap food to poor Greeks in immigrant neighbourhoods. They were given free reign to tackle crime there without compromise. They championed a greater Greece, tapping into a strong nationalist sentiment sharpened by the austerity imposed by foreign credit. They offered simple solutions to complex problems. Tax breaks for investors who employed Greeks only. Nationalisation of banks bailed out by the state. Expulsion of illegal immigrants. Michal Oliakos says he's proud to go to jail. With Trumpian rhetoric, he decries the dirty junta of politics, media and courts. He says history will vindicate him and thank the 400,000-plus people who once voted for his party. They've deserted him for now, with under 3% support at last year's election. But there's an appeal in the offing, and the problems he exploited haven't gone away. So maybe it's foolhardy to call it the final chapter for Golden Dawn. Mike Sanders re reporting from Greece. The transcripts of a 2016 deposition with the former girlfriend of the disgraced financier and dis uh, deceased sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, this is Ghislaine Maxwell, have been released. The testimony was made in a now settled civil defamation lawsuit brought by one of his accusers. Miss, Wa Miss Maxwell had long fought to keep the testimony secret. She will go on trial in a criminal case next year and has pleaded not guilty. She's accused of helping Epstein traffic and sexually abuse underage girls girls and of perjury for denying involvement in such a scheme when she gave her deposition under oath. 
The 58-year-old has been in custody since her arrest in July. If convicted, she could be sentenced up to 35 years in prison. In this now-released deposition, she denies ever seeing Epstein involved in inappropriate underage activities. She says she never hired anyone under the age of 18 to work in Epstein's homes and never participated in any sexual activities with them. By the middle of the 20th century, the city of Grimsby on England's east coast was the biggest fishing port in the world. But from the 1970s onwards, fishing has been in decline. Today it contributes just a tenth of 1% to Britain's economy. And yet, this tiny industry could be one of the reasons the UK fails in the coming days to sort out a post-Brexit trade deal with the European Union. The UK says any new agreement on fisheries must be based on the understanding that British fishing grounds are first and foremost for British boats. The BBC's Lucy Ash filed this report from Grimsby to find out why the Brits are still hooked on their fish. The English fishermen have been pushed aside and we've ended up with a skeleton of a fishery. We have. I'm on board a fishing boat called Sweetwater. Its skipper is Darren Kenyon. I've been fishing since I was 13 year old, so 40 years now. And, and what kind of changes have you seen? A lot of people have packed up, but French boats or Spanish boats can come and take the fish. The fish, what you're not allowed to catch, if we caught it, we would be arrested on the quayside. But how many people are there in Grimsby now doing what you're doing? There's only about 10 of us in Grimsby, really. Only 10? Yes, we're a handful of people, I'm afraid. When Britain joined the forerunner to the European Union back in 1973, its seas became a common European resource. Brussels later introduced a quota system. For many species, it gave European boats, by law, a greater entitlement to fish in British waters than the British themselves. That's unfair, says the local MP, Lee Anici. We have some of the richest fishing grounds in Europe and we don't have any control, and that is the reason why people voted for Brexit, voted for Boris Johnson. Better times lie ahead once the UK is out of the common fisheries policy, Nietzsche says. Come 1st of January, we want to be out there. We are ready to go. There's room for it to grow, and I think the town is going to flourish once we've left the EU. And fishing as well? Yes, fishing will flourish again. But after decades of decline, Grimsby is moving on to other things. If you stand here on the shoreline, you can see the gleaming white blades of wind turbines a few kilometres offshore. Thousands more of these are planned much further out in what used to be fishing grounds as Britain tries to wean itself off fossil fuels. With all the new recruitment going on, I've had so many people message and ask so many questions because they all want to be in the position I am. 23-year-old Georgia Turell is a turbine technician for a Danish company called Orsted, which builds and runs offshore wind farms. Unlike fishing, which traditionally viewed women on board as bad luck, this industry welcomes both sexes. These days, says Georgia, everybody in Grimsby is talking about wind. I've got a job for life here. We're growing as a company and it's just getting bigger and bigger every single day. That report by Lucy Ash in Grimsby. And finally, a court in London has accused the former Wimbledon tennis champion Boris Becker of concealing wealth that could have helped settle his debts. The charges in failing to hand over uh, Grand Slam trophies. Among those listed was the silverware the German star won in 1985 when he rose to fame as Wimbledon's youngest men's champion at the age of 17. Boris Becker, who was declared bankrupt three years ago, denies the accusations. He's due to go on trial in September next year. And that's World Watch for today. I'm Max Toll. Apologies again for saying hooked on fish <laughs> just before. Uh, Marnie? <laughs> Kia ora, Max. Uh, koina te pūrongo o te pautūtanga mō tēnei rā, Friday, October the 23rd. And stay with RNZ for today's COVID briefing with the Minister of Health, Chris Hipkins, and Director General of Health, Ashley Bloomfield. Have a great long weekend. We'll be back on Tuesday, of course, and a big mahi to our producers, Denise Garland, Michael Kropp, and our operator, Cass Saunders. But from us, kia pai, tōkau tōra, no hōra mai.
RNZ News at one o'clock. Good afternoon. Ko Kainwin Curtis, Toko Ingoa. And we'll cross to the news conference at the Thea- Beehive Theatre as soon as it starts. In the meantime, here are our top stories. The Ministry for Primary Industries will tighten live export rules following the sinking of the Gulf Livestock One in the East China Sea. This comes after the release of a report done for the Ministry by Mike Heron QC. The report was commissioned after the sinking of the ship with 43 crew, including two New Zealanders and nearly 6,000 cattle on board. All live shipments were banned after that event pending the inquiry. The Ministry says there will now be extra requirements on exporters. These include focused inspections of all livestock carrier ships entering New Zealand waters, restricting stocking density and increasing voyage reporting. A gym manager says about 10 people are considered close contacts of a person who later tested positive for COVID-19. They were at an outdoor boot camp run by the Snap Fitness Gym in the North Shore suburb of Browns Bay last Saturday. The gym has also closed for cleaning because the positive case visited the facility after the boot camp. However, General Manager Brandon Hurrell says others who were at the gym at the same time are only considered casual contacts. He says they've deep cleaned the gym twice and it'll be disinfected with fog today. They're waiting to hear from officials on tracing and are considering reopening tomorrow. Flight delays out of Wellington Airport following a fire in the main terminal this morning are expected to continue until 5 o'clock this evening. Hundreds of passengers and staff were evacuated just after half past 8 after a small fire was detected in a light fitting above an escalator on level 1. A Wellington Airport spokesperson says the cause has been thoroughly investigated and isolated to a single faulty light fitting. Kia ora everybody, good afternoon, it's good to be back. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is of course my first COVID-19 media conference since the election. So before I hand over to the Director General for the regular case update, I did want to uh, make a few opening comments. It's now seven months since our first confirmed case of COVID-19 in New Zealand. In that, term, in that time we have learned a huge amount about this virus and we continue to learn, learn new things all of the time. We've made significant progress in our ability to contain and to eliminate it. We've vastly improved our contact tracing. We've, pro- we've processed more than a million tests, giving us one of the highest testing rates in the world. We've established a comprehensive managed isolation and quarantine system uh, to halt the virus at our borders. And as you've heard uh, me say before, uh, New Zealand has uh, results that are the envy of many other countries around the world. Uh, thank you very much. Um, to the team of 5 million who continue to play their part uh, in making sure that we are containing and eliminating COVID-19. But our success does not mean there is ever any room for complacency. Recent cases show just how difficult and tricky the virus can be and how we need to constantly stay on alert regardless of where the alert levels are at. In just the last few weeks, We've seen historical cases, cases in managed isolation from New Zealanders who are returning from overseas. This week's cases include uh, Russian fisheries workers, and we've seen uh, the case related to the uh, marine engineer who worked on the Safrana Seville. The fact that we're managing these cases while at alert level one, it's reassuring, and it's a tribute to our robust border management, our comprehensive testing, and our contact tracing. But it's also a reminder that COVID-19 is still with us and it is still rampant around the rest of the world. To remain safe, we all have to remain vigilant. So as we head into the long weekend, we have a few key reminders of the simple steps that everybody can take to continue our fight against COVID-19. First and foremost, if you are sick or you are showing symptoms, please stay home and seek medical advice. If you have COVID-19 symptoms, please call Healthline on 0800 611 116 and arrange to get a test. Healthline should be your first port of call. They will tell you where you can get a test. Everybody should continue to use the COVID Tracer app or keep some other record of their movements. It only takes a few seconds to scan in but it can make a huge difference if you need to be contacted about potential exposure to the virus. 
if you can't observe physical distancing, such as on a plane or on a bus, wear a face covering. We're all used to face coverings in public now. We had plenty of experience of that when the country was at alert level two, and there is no reason not to use them now as well. Wash your hands and sneeze into your elbow. <coughs> this afternoon, all COVID Tracer app users uh, will receive a reminder via the alert uh, system in the app to encourage them to use the scanning system as they go about their day. Um, I'd also like to remind all New Zealand businesses that they can play a very important role here too. The pub in Greenhithe could equally have been any other business or venue around the country. So whether businesses are planning a Labour weekend sale or expecting local tourists over the holiday weekend, you all have a role to play in keeping our economy moving and keeping our people safe. So please make sure your QR codes are displayed prominently. They're easily accessible to anybody coming and going. And I particularly want to send a message to hospitality businesses. Um, please encourage people to scan in when they arrive at your premises. Uh, we know how to pre prevent the spread of COVID-19 in New Zealand. We've done it many, many times, uh, but we all continue to need to play our part. So enjoy your long Labour weekend with your friends and your family, but keep yourself and the community safe by being COVID conscious. So I'd now like to hand over to the Director General for today's case update. Thank you, Minister. Kia ora koutou katoa. So today we're reporting nine new cases of COVID-19. Eight of these have been identified in managed isolation facilities, and one is a close household contact of one of the cases uh, that we have already confirmed in the marine employee cluster, as we're calling it. So seven of the cases uh, in managed isolation involve fishing crew who are in the Christchurch Sedema facility. These were identified at day six testing undertaken yesterday. And I should say we do expect there may be more positive cases uh, as the balance of the tests are processed from the day six testing today. The other case from managed isolation is a person whose travel involved them, uh, originated in Iran, travelled via Dubai and who arrived on the 19th of October. And that person tested positive following routine day three testing and they are now in our Auckland quarantine facility. So our total number of active cases is 66 and our total number of confirmed cases is 1,567. Yesterday, our laboratories completed 6,053 uh, tests for COVID-19 and the grand total of tests completed to date in New Zealand is 1,054,047. Just a, a further update on weekend testing available, the Auckland Metro DHBs are monitoring demand for testing closely and will further increase testing capacity over the long weekend. Uh, there will be plenty of testing opportunities available, as the Minister mentioned, in addition to seven community testing centres open right across the region over the long weekend. Uh, it's also available in a number of urgent care clinics and general practices. Uh, and uh, a reminder to anybody, wherever they have a swab for COVID-19, it is free of charge. Full details of the testing availability in Auckland is also available on the Auckland Regional Public Health website, including the hours of availability. And wherever you are in New Zealand over this coming weekend, call Healthline and they will be able to tell you where and when you can be tested closest to where you are. I do want to thank New Zealanders, especially Aucklanders, who are doing the right thing, remaining vigilant, self-isolating and getting tested, even if they have the slightest symptoms. Uh, those actions will help individuals, their families and communities to stay safe. I also want to just in advance thank the people who will be working across the health system over this coming long weekend, uh, both in the community and in our hospitals, uh, and also in our laboratories uh, processing the tests over the weekend. Thank you for your ongoing commitment. Just a reminder regarding the cases in Auckland, anyone who was at that uh, Malt House pub in Greenhithe on Friday night, if you haven't already, then, uh, or if you are a member of a household of someone who was there, please isolate and be tested. Uh, yesterday, over, there were over 270 tests undertaken at that pop-up uh, testing uh, centre in Greenhithe, so great response there from the local community. And please stay in isolation until you receive your results. We have got in place a system to ensure that anyone who is tested gets the results back 
as quickly as possible so it is uh, uh, causing the less disruption uh, as possible to, for, to their weekend plans. We've had a look at the data that was sent out uh, from the push notification to people who had scanned in to the pub on Friday night, and I must say very few people had used the app and scanned in on the Friday night. So a reminder, I can't stress uh, enough, uh, we have high uptake of the app. It's excellent. It's amongst the highest, I think, of countries that have got such an app. It's only, uh, it's really useful if people use it. And so please do uh, scan in wherever you are this weekend. The more we scan, the safer we'll be. And the faster we respond, the faster we will stop the virus spreading. Time is our friend here. Uh, finally, just a comment on privacy and the role of the media. Uh, yesterday at the stand up in, uh, up at the road in the Ministry of Health, uh, I thanked the media for the role they had played in getting the message out to people who had been at that pub on Friday night. And I just want to say we've become aware of an incident where a member of the media went to the house of one of the um, positive cases associated with that Auckland Marine cluster uh, twice in the last couple of days. The person, the media rep, went to the door and spoke with a family member who was at that time a close contact, which meant there is the potential that that person the, from the media could be infected with the virus. The person who was at that uh, house was self-isolating and when they came to the door was expecting uh, health officials to be there. Now, our information suggests that the media employee was a contact and as a result of their, uh, their actions may need to be placed into isolation and tested. That, that was our initial information. I'm pleased to say that we have reviewed the security footage from the house and established that there was a distance of at least five metres between the media rep and the close contact who was, who, who was in that house. So thankfully, this does mean there's very little risk of transmission and the employee of the media was not at risk. However, um, we're also aware that uh, media have been repeatedly contact one of, contacting one of our cases, cases and that person has now um, actually uh, stopped answering their phone. They are in, self in isolation in our quarantine facility, but this could potentially slow down our public health response. I greatly appreciate the role that the media has played in supporting our efforts around that pandemic, but just a reminder to please respect the processes that are in place and particularly the privacy of individuals so that you can continue to support our overall efforts to contain the virus. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Dr Bloomfield. Before we take your questions, I just want to reiterate a few key points about testing over the long weekend, and then I've got one other issue to raise. Uh, it's imperative that anybody uh, who has symptoms can get a test easily and quickly. And to support that, there will be over 150 sites, testing sites, operating around New Zealand for at least part of the weekend. Auckland will have seven community testing centres that will be open across all three days of the weekend. Uh, we've asked DHBs to ensure in their hospitals that where there is no DHB, uh, where there is no GP clinic testing available, that they have swabbing available in their emergency departments should that be required. We've also asked them to make sure that their websites are up to date with the most recent uh, testing centre locations and information. And of course, the key message to everybody is first port of call is to ring Healthline and they will tell you where you can most easily get a test. Before we get into questions, though, I want to take a moment to say a word of thanks and to acknowledge somebody. Uh, John Ombler has attempted to retire from the New Zealand Public Service several times before. Uh, and whenever he has done that, we have pressed him back into service. He has been playing a lead role uh, in the government's COVID-19 response, coordinating our all-of-government effort. Today is his last day in the building. He signed off at lunchtime today uh, on behalf of the government and, in fact, on behalf of the people of New Zealand. Uh, I want to take a moment to extend a very warm thank you to him. Uh, his work is largely being behind the scenes, would not have been noticed by many people, uh, but it has been critical to our COVID-19 response. So uh, we thank John and wish him all the best with his next attempt at retirement. Questions? Minister, you, um, Ashley Bloomfield said that there was only a few people that signed into the pub um, on the night in question. Is that quite disappointing for, from your perspective? Yeah, what you all have heard me say all the time is we need to stay vigilant. We need to keep using the COVID Tracer app. We have made it compulsory for businesses to display the QR codes, you know, prominently, so it's as easy as possible for people to use it. Um, my message to all Kiwis is please keep playing your part. You, you know, it, it might not have been the pub. It might have been somewhere where they had been. Um, we need to be able to let you know if you've been somewhere where someone has been with COVID-19. We've question. seen the numbers of people signing in um, steadily start declining. Um, I, 
apparently this message isn't actually getting through, this please, can we keep doing it? Is there a way that the government or officials can do something else to make sure that there's a little bit more compliance? So we'll have a very intensive um, campaign over the next sort of 72 hours over the long weekend, just encouraging people to use the QR code, um, you know, really pushing out that message about the need to be prepared. I think one of the media headlines I saw from one of you who was writing uh, in the last sort of 48 hours or so said, we're a nation that responds rather than a nation that prepares. Um, and I think that's probably a fair analysis of where we're at at the moment. Um, and my message to everybody is the more we prepare, the less we're going to need to respond. Barry, up The engineer uh, who had the COVID-19, did he swipe in at the pub? Uh, I don't actually have that information, so I'm not sure. So this was uh, someone who worked at the same firm as the engineer. I don't, I don't have that specific information. Yeah. What, sorry, what, why can't you make it uh, compulsory for people to swipe the QR code whenever they go into any business? There'd be an enforcement issue with that. Um, that would be a, that would be very very resource intensive. If you can imagine, if, you know, someone standing outside the supermarket, so making sure everybody's scanning in. Someone, you know, like every business would have to be supervising that. That would be incredibly resource intensive. I wouldn't say we would never do that. It may well be something we did at, at higher alert levels, uh, but at alert level one. I think the message is, you know, every New Zealander should play their part here. We shouldn't need to make it compulsory for people to be doing the right thing. I think New Zealanders have shown over the last seven months um, that actually we do want to do the right thing. Um, and at the moment, my message is doing the right thing means keeping a, record, a good record of your movements. Well, the same the same rules. Rules. Oh, I'll, come, I'll come over here, sorry. Do you have the exact numbers for the amount of people who scanned in on, um, at the pub on Friday? Uh, I don't have the exact number, but uh, as I've said, it was, it was very few people. Um, and uh, obviously we want to shift that so that people are routinely scanning. And uh, as the Minister said, uh, there will be an intensive campaign this weekend. I think we've given the message out, and thanks to, to you who have actually carried that message through. So I'm hopeful that we will see New Zealanders responding to that over the next Are people becoming complacent then? Oh, I think it's, uh, it's as the Minister said, we, we quickly fall into the pattern of alert level one, uh, ready to... Um, uh, rather than responding to a, the threat that is there, but we've seen, we've had these cases over the last week. There is an ongoing threat there. The pandemic is not going away anywhere soon. What we have done matters for nothing. It's what we do now and what we do next that really counts. The other comment I would make is, this is a really good opportunity this long weekend for us to, in a sense, rehearse what we will need to do over the Christmas break. Uh, I'm sure everybody is keen to have a, a relaxing uh, Christmas break and get away for it. The sooner we can do these things and lock them into our daily routines, the more likely we will be able to do it and um, and have a safe Christmas New Year break. Do doctors from Napier being sent over to that ship linked to the port worker who had COVID-19? Sorry, the, the, the... the team of doctors from Napier being transported to that ship. Yes, so a team of doctors flew, flew onto the ship um, yesterday off the, that's been offshore in Napier to, to undertake the testing. Um, all of those test results came back negative, um, which would suggest that um, that's not the source of infection. Um, so this was the ship that was in New Plymouth and then travelled around to Napier. Um, the most likely source of you know, infection at the moment, the current working theory is still that it's the Safrana Seville, which is no longer in New Zealand. Um, but the, the, the residual risk is that... Um, uh, is whether they picked it up um, off the marine, you know, on the off the marine worker, um, and so hence, you know, the testing is a is an encouraging sign. Minister, Minister, why Minister, have you are you ruled, uh, Minister, we, Minister, we are you, are you Minister, are you ruling out making the app use compulsory at level one? At this point, we always keep reviewing everything. So, I mean, one of the dilemmas around COVID-19 is, you know, ruling things in, in and out. You'll, you'll note that I very seldom rule things in and out uh, unequivocally because we're always looking at what we need to do, what settings we need to tweak in order to make sure our response is as robust as it possibly can be. And we look at, um, you know, every day the facts change, every day the, the, the situation in front of us changes, and we need to adapt to that. But at this point, at this point, as of today, we are not going to be making it compulsory. <laughs> Is there scope for some sort of fine or, or some sort of punishment if people don't scan in? Or is that Look, too premature? One of the risks that we've, we've seen around COVID-19, and, and one of the reasons I think New Zealand's response has been um, successful, is that we've taken an encouraging approach rather than a punitive one. 
the last thing we want to do is uh, adopt a punitive approach, which means people sort of start rebelling and stop cooperating. We saw this with, um, with the issue around contact tracing. So if you start being heavy-handed with people around contact tracing, then they stop sharing information with you. On the other hand, if you're working collaboratively with them, you're, you're working on a no-blame basis, then actually people will work really, really hard to give you as much information as possible. So, so I've not seen any evidence to suggest we should be adopting a punitive approach. Actually, what the, the approach we've got now works quite well. Mikey. Your thoughts on, on that issue, Dr Bloomfield, because you've spoken about the fact that the virus isn't going anywhere. Is it sustainable to continue on? with this sort of encouragement and high trust model or do you think there will come a point where we do need something a bit you know more tangible than that so I'd like to pick up on your comment around high trust and I think this uh, picks up on what the minister said actually we have been successful to date because of a high trust um, arrangement uh, and uh, in my, in my mind I, I, because people have had these behaviour, done these behaviours before, they have um, scanned regu uh, regularly, they have used masks on public transport and on flights. I feel confident that if people see the benefits of doing that in alert level one, that they will again take up those behaviours. And so uh, many public health interventions rely on high trust and a sense uh, and encouragement. And uh, another good example here in New Zealand is vaccination. Most people especially if they have good information, will actually actually be vaccinated or vaccinate their children. And I think this will continue to be the mainstay of our success and our response in Alert Level 1. So why have you not already implemented weekly testing of high-risk port workers? Uh, no, that they are being routinely tested. It typically is fortnightly for those higher-risk port workers. I do just want to say a word about port workers. Um, <clears throat> what we've seen is the number of port workers being tested um, has been reducing. And one of the reasons, I've been looking very closely at that, and one of the reasons for that is that the ports are taking active measures to limit the number of people who might be at risk. So, for example, the number of stevedores and pilots going onto a ship, um, they've been narrowing that down to a very small group rather than having a large group of people going onto ships when they're coming in. So that those testing numbers are going down, but that's for a good reason, uh, because they're not exposing as many people to a, a likely risk. The number of thousands of people interact with our ports up and down the country every day. The proportion of those who are at risk of exposure to COVID-19 is actually a relatively small number, and those people are being tested regularly. So various public health experts have told us it's shocking foreign ship crews can be, um, can change others, can fly into the country without being tested or needing to isolate before getting on their vessel. Why is this still permitted? So we, we, we've been looking at that very closely just in the last few days as a result of the most recent issues we've been dealing with. Uh, those who are staying in managed isolation, so who are stopping at the airport or near the airport and staying for a period of time, uh, will now be tested. Um, that will be become a, a requirement for them. Um, there are occasions, though, where people are flying and they are transferring directly to a ship and then they're sailing out again, um, and, it, and testing would delay that process. Um, the risk there is very, very low, um, and so uh, that would, testing them wouldn't necessarily add anything to our protection. Um, but where they're stopping for any, any length of time, even if it's just an overnight stay, we will be uh, making sure that they are tested. How many, How many empty... Auckland Bullet. port workers watering uh, the Safrana um, Seville and were subsequently never contacted by public health to get tested. Um, you say our systems are robust. This doesn't sound robust at all, does it? Uh, so look, we'd have to look at that. My understanding is that there have been good records of everybody that went onto the ship, uh, that all those people who have gone onto the ship have, have been contacted. One of the things that they were in discussions about and that the ports are actively discussing themselves um, is whether there are further things they could do to speed up that process. For example, um, should every new ship that, are, that, that comes into port be issued a QR code that applies for the time that they're in port. Now that would speed up the process somewhat, but my understanding and the advice that I have had um, is that good records were kept of people who went onto the ship um, and that those people have been contacted, but I'll, again I'll ask the Director General if he has anything to add. That's to my that. information too, Minister. I think the Public Health Unit moved swiftly, worked with the port and the owners of the ship to identify anyone who had been on board, uh, including pilots, the exact stevedores and anyone else who had visited the port. They were stood down tested and remain uh, con treated as close contacts for the time being. Why how, the come back to Barry, I think I heard you booming yeah, up how, the many, back, how many empty beds do we currently have in managed isolation? Uh, I might have those numbers here. I've, uh, if I've got the latest daily sheet uh, on those. We have a vacancy rate. At the moment we've got six. Our current uh, occupancy is 4,962. 
um, with a current capacity of 6,261. Who's funding for those? Uh, well, we, we are, obviously, but, the, but bear in mind that, um, that that doesn't necessarily tell the full picture. For example, when we get a positive COVID-19 case, um, those rooms aren't all immediately reoccupied. Um, we do have to preserve some capability here. Um, some of the vacancy rate will be based on what we're expecting to be incoming. So we are better forecasting now and we're continuing to improve. I'm not managing this, I'm not the minister managing this at the moment, um, but the forecasting work that um, Dr Woods uh, and her team have been doing is helping us to better predict um, when, when we're likely to see people coming in so that we can manage our um, our managed isolation facility capacity to its fullest extent, but we will always need to be carrying some vacancy rates uh, because from time to time we do need to accommodate people at short notice. So, uh, you just said you're the minister not managing this at the moment. Does that mean that you'll be managing it in the future? That was a very nice try, but you'll just have to leave that one to the PM. Amazing. Yeah. Um, not of that, but um, we've been told that uh, there's potentially another outbreak in West Auckland. There's like um, amongst the Pacific community, um, there's um, sort of may have gone to churches and that sort of thing. Is there any truth to those to that at all? I'll, I'll, I'll ask the Director General to comment on that. I've certainly not been alluded to anything that would be consistent with that. No, there were some uh, rumours circulating last evening, but I can say that that's not the case. Why hasn't we we'll come to Joe after that. Just talking about the forecasting before, for the most part, is the expectation that those numbers will have will drop off and continue to drop off? Because most people who were going to choose to come back probably would have by now, wouldn't they? Uh, so we, we are... Uh, there, there is a minister's group that are coordinating this, um, and one of the things we're, we're looking at is, because of course we, in addition to New Zealanders returning, we also have essential worker exemptions coming in, um, and so as um, if the number of New Zealanders continues to decline, then obviously we'll be looking to fill those spaces with other essential workers coming in. So you've already seen exemptions for a range of essential workers, um, for a small group of international students, for example, PhD um, international students, about 150 of those. Um, we have got a prioritised list that we're working our way through. We're still working through the prioritisation process, but, the, but our intention here is we'd still want those uh, managed isolation facilities to be operating at a reasonable capacity, bearing in mind we have to carry some vacancy, um, and if we see the demand starting to tail off from New Zealanders returning, then we'd be looking to fill those spaces with others. Right, but there isn't a situation where you start to close some of the hotels down in areas because you just there's no demand. You will just find other people to That's bring right. in. Look, there is huge demand at the border. Um, up until now, um, most of our space has been reserved for those returning, you know, New Zealanders returning. Um, as the, if, if pressure starts to ease in that area, there's still demand in other areas and we'd be looking to, to tap into that to make sure that we're allowing people to come into the country. So we're seeing more people, for example, who may have been on work visas who had been based in New Zealand. They weren't included in that returning residents and citizens category. They are a priority for us to, al to allow them to come back into the country as well. So there are a variety of other groups that we'd be looking to make sure we're facilitating back in. with your education hat on that, talking mm. about international students, where are things at with that space? I mean, what sort of numbers can we expect to see come through? Uh, so we've approved 150 PhD students at the moment. Um, obviously, it's going to depend on capacity to manage um, isolation at the border. We do want to allow for more international students to come back into the country as we are able to do so. But I think as you've seen, um, even with the, the fisheries cases that we've been dealing with this week, the idea that we can just start popping up a whole lot of new uh, managed isolation facilities without increasing the risk. I think that's something that we've always been aware. Whenever you expand capacity, you increase risk. Um, and we manage that risk very, very closely. I've, you've got a question over here. You've been waiting very patiently. Uh, why hasn't the government made masks compulsory on public transport in Auckland when the majority of people clearly aren't following the recommendation right now? Look, at alert level one, um, our view at this point is that it's not needed, that we don't need to make it mandatory. Um, but th that's one of those things that we always keep under review. I wouldn't ever rule it out, but at this point, uh, we, we're not going to do that. That would be a decision that I wouldn't make individually as a minister. It's a decision that the whole cabinet would make. And we spoke to a oh, sorry, yeah, come back. We spoke to a patron at the Greenwich Pub who told us that he would not get tested even after being asked by health officials. What, what can the ministry do about that? Oh, I'd invite the Director General to comment on that. I can personally appeal to him to go and get tested, please. Uh, it's not something we can do compulsorily, but uh, what I would like to say is that many members of that community have clearly been tested, and I want to thank them for their response, and I hope that this person will um, also play their part. So just so 
Yeah. When, when you're no, talking you to people, Mikey, come up with me here. People like that should be made known to authorities, and should they be kept an eye on in terms of whether or not they are self-isolating and just not posing any further threat to the community if they are refusing tests? I think uh, what I would say is our success to date has been because everybody has done their bit. And uh, we have shown that through our collective efforts we have done really well. And uh, we want to continue that. So I can just, you know, every New Zealander needs to do their bit. But whether it's a blatant refusal to get tested, should they then be sort of put under the microscope, make sure that they're not sort of you're just walking around perhaps, you know, infecting others? Yeah. Well, we do have options to... Um, uh, require people to go into isolation and or be tested if we feel they pose a risk, and that would particularly apply to people who were close contacts, known close contacts of existing cases. Uh, for the very most part, we don't need to do that, and we've seen a really high degree of support and cooperation from people uh, to date, and we'd like to see that continue. You said you personally reach out to these persons. I mean, what yeah. sort of... Would it be like a good cop, good Ashley, bad Ashley sort of thing? Like which would you be more um, sort of bringing down the hammer or more sort of, hey do this for the, the community? What, what's all, yeah. How would that conversation go, I guess, is what well, I Well, I don't know who the individual is, but I'm just saying, actually, anyone who hasn't yet been tested, including this person, uh, please do your, your bit and uh, go and get a test and isolate till you get the result. We will get the result back as quickly as possible. Uh, if you're bothered about having the swab, I've had one myself, I think the Minister has, um, and uh, it's uh, bearable. All right, I'll be the bad cop here and say last couple of questions. Barry. Would, would you like to stay on the health roll? Nice try. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, look, look. Um, it's it's ultimately a uh, decision for the prime minister. It's an enormous privilege to be a minister of anything, um, and I'll leave all of the comment on that to her. Over the weekend, you um, secured the, the the highest margin in the country in your electorate seat. How does it feel being essentially the most popular electorate MP in the country? Um, look, I'm very humbled. Um, I, I welcome the support of the local community, and it is actually a, a, an incredible privilege. Um, and I don't take that lightly. And, um, you know, look, I, being a member of parliament is an enormous privilege. Being a minister in the government is an even bigger privilege. And it's not something I would ever take for granted. Prime Minister? Oh, 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 you, did you, you had a, you had a question oh, here? Just, I was just going to say, on the back of that, it's been a long campaign. Do you have any plans for the Labour weekend? Uh, a bit of time with the family, actually. It's my, my son's birthday was uh, last weekend. Not, not great timing. So we're going to do his birthday this weekend. Well, that's on the official inquiry into the, um, into the country's response, could you just make some comments around that, please? Look, I think we've always acknowledged that at some point there'll be a, a, it will be an appropriate time to have a, a proper, thorough inquiry. For now, our focus is on continual improvement, so we're always looking for how we can improve things. Um, but I don't want to distract people who are absolutely focused on continuing to respond to COVID-19 from that very critical job while they're still doing that. So at some future point, whether it's a royal commission or some other, you know, formalised review, that will happen. It should happen. Um, but we're just not at that point yet. We still need people firmly focused on looking ahead and making sure we're doing everything necessary to respond to the challenges in front of us. Um, the New Zealand Institute of Safety Management is proposing an immediate task force to develop improved protocols alongside WorkSafe. Um, to help maintain the health of workers at risk of COVID-19. Is that something um, that you would support, or what are your thoughts on that? Look, need to look at that some more. Obviously, we're always looking at where workers may be at risk, wherever they're working, um, and looking to minimise that as much as possible. WorkSafe have a role there. The Ministry of Health, of course, play a very active role here, as do public health units. Um, so we're always looking at that. So we're looking at the border workers, we're looking at those who work in managed isolation facilities, constantly looking at our infection and uh, prevention and control practices. Um, so one of the things that the Director General um, commissioned not long after I became the Minister of Health um, was a review of the infection prevention and control in all of those managed managed isolation facility so we could identify areas where uh, where we could do things better and we always learn as we're going along so for example you may recall several I think several weeks ago now may have even been longer than that the issue of the wheelie bin um, where we've identified an area where we can continue to, to strengthen and tighten our infection prevention and control so we're always looking at those things. Going back to port workers you did mention that we're being tested frequently but why are they being so why aren't they being tested weekly as opposed to fortnightly? It's based on, on ultimately on a risk assessment. Um, so at the time we put that system in place, the risk assessment was that fortnightly would be appropriate. Risk assessments, by their nature, are always being assessed. 
So you're always looking at, okay, have we got that right? So we will always look at that and we'll consider whether or not some people who are tested fortnightly need to go weekly and whether some people who are tested weekly need to go fortnightly. Those are things that we're always looking at. Um, but at the moment it's fortnightly, but we, we keep that under constant review. And again, I'll ask the Director General to comment on that. Look, I think a, a, another relevant comment here, Minister, is that the testing is just part of the arrangements in place to protect the workforce and also protect the border. So there's use of PPE, there's physical distancing, and a range of other measures, infection prevention control on vessels, restricting movement around the ports, all these things are part of the package. This latest case gives us a good opportunity to look at that end to end and see are there any learnings and therefore what else might we do to strengthen the, um, the border. It has served us very well to date. This is the first time we have identified an infection coming into the community from a ship since uh, the COVID outbreak started. Okay, just, sorry, how are we feeling? Ali, you, you, have, you have the second to last question and you can have the last one, okay? Here we go. I was going to say, but as a safeguard, should we be making it weekly? Uh, look, as I said, we keep that under constant review. I'm not announcing anything on that today, but we, we always look at those things. Um, and how uh, both of you feeling about this outbreak? Is it still well contained in your eyes? Are we sort of at a green or uh, amber level sort of? Oh, look, I'm sure the Director General will have thoughts on this. You know, I, I get briefed on cases every day. Um, and uh, at this point, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I stay awake at night thinking about them all, regardless of where we're at, but um, at this point, this is n not causing me heightened levels of anxiety, but then just the more sort of the usual levels of anxiety, but uh, <laughs> Director General. Thank you. I won't comment on my levels of anxiety, <laughs> except to say that uh, we have a, a, a team, a cross-government team, National Response Leadership Team. It's been meeting daily, and we met just this morning again to look at the latest cases, the pattern, and where things are at with contact tracing, and feeling comfortable that at the moment, alert level one is certainly the posture we need to be in. And all the signs are a week on from when we detected this first case that uh, the, the outbreak seem, is, is well controlled, and we can hope to continue that, and we will keep you updated on a daily basis. All right, we might call it a day there. Thank you, everybody. Cheers.